Thank you, Jill, and welcome everyone. And this is a wonderful opportunity to exchange information and news across a boundary that is uh, sometimes very hard to cross. But again, I'm Margaret Williams, Director of World Wildlife Fund's US Arctic Program. I'm based in Anchorage, Alaska. And just a one word about World Wildlife Fund. We are an international conservation organization and we have offices around the world and in all of the Arctic countries. And the Arctic is a very high priority for conservation for World Wildlife Fund. And from um, here in Anchorage, Alaska, we have many partners that we work with. And one of our close partners is AOS, the Alaska Ocean Observing System. So we're really glad to work with AOS to host this event. And this is the second in a series of US-Russia science discussions or share, knowledge sharing discussions uh, where we're supporting exchange of information across this maritime boundary. And as you know, Russia and the US have a very long maritime boundary that we share. Uh, we have many cultural ties and family ties between Alaska and Russia. And of course, there are so many species, birds and fish and mammals that um, are using these shared waters. And so we wanted to um, provide a, a platform for colleagues to share what's going on. There have been so many changes in the last decade, really in the last five years, especially with the disappearance of the sea ice. And so people are observing massive changes with um, seabirds, marine mammal strandings, and so forth. And so um, last year and the year before, there were a lot of um, people in Alaska wondering, well, what's happening on the Russian side and vice versa. So we would like to make these science corners, we call them science dialogues, an opportunity to bring people together and find a way to uh, share what each other, what each side is observing. Um, I wanted to thank our Russian colleagues and our US colleagues for taking time to present this, um, their information. And today's gonna be really fun because we have, um, we have our twin islands, the Pribilofs and the commanders um, being represented. And we have, um, American and Russian counterparts who are studying similar species, but in different parts of the Bering Sea and the Arctic. So I think it's going to be great fun and uh, we'll learn a lot. And I wanted to thank Molly McCammon, our moderator. Molly has been the director, executive director of AOS for 17 years. She's just uh, transitioning now to a senior advisor position. And before AOS, she had um, uh, many duties regarding um, um, bringing together science and policy. She was the executive director of the Exxon Valdez Trustees Council. She has been a member of the National Research um, Council's Polar Research Board and on uh, many science advisory boards under NOAA and other agencies. So um, Molly is going to be our timekeeper and our moderator and will chair the question and answer sessions following each um, presentation block. So over to you, Molly. Thanks very much, Margaret. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And as you mentioned, this is a, a follow on from our session um, at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium in January. And at that time, we had such a positive response from that session. But most of the people we heard from said, we want, we want to dive deeper. We want more dialogue. We want to learn more about these things. So it's really a great opportunity to focus just on a particular uh, trophic level or a particular um, suite of species. So we're glad to be here today doing this. Um, our first speaker is going to be Kathy Kulitz. Uh, she is the seabird coordinator for the Migratory Bird Management Program of the US Fish and Wildlife Service here in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, Kathy has more than 30 years of experience um, studying seabirds in Alaska, working with a number of programs, uh, both uh, in Alaska nationally and also circumpolar with the um, with the CAF program. And just a little known fact, both Kathy and I grew up in a desert, small desert town in California. And here we are uh, both working on ocean issues in Alaska. So uh, quite the transition for us. So welcome Kathy. And um, she will be talking about seabirds in a changing Arctic. Thank you, Molly. So and also I want to uh, recognize my colleagues, Rob Kaler, Liz Lebunsky, and Dan Cushing, among others, and all the who worked with me on many of these projects, and also our, our main funders and all the various projects and people who supported this 
primarily the um, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the North Pacific Research Board. Um, this slide seems to be moving without my touching it, but I'm going to be focusing on the at sea component here of our studies. Uh, you can see by the, at the map on the lower right there, um, this shows our survey effort. We have over 150,000 kilometers of transects now, 2007 to 2019. The stars indicate where there are large colonies, uh, seabird colonies, of course, is an important area for seabirds, uh, but we'll be focusing on the offshore area. And I also want to recognize the many collaborators that made all these studies possible. You can see that partly on the list on the left there. And it's not moving now. There, so take a, a broad look, stepping back a bit. Um, I just wanted to point out that, as you might expect, going south to north, species richness declines a bit. Uh, the Bering Sea has the highest richness with about 50 species. The Chukchi is intermediate with about 40 species. And the Beaufort is the lowest at around 30 to 32 species. Um, if you look at the lower right hand uh, graphic, however, there is some indication that at least the North Bering Sea and Chukchi Sea have converged somewhat in terms of species richness as the indication that the Chukchi has gained species as the Bering Sea may be uh, losing them. So we have a, a variety, of course, that we have a lot of species and they can divide, be divided into planktivorous and piscivorous and, and omnivorous. But our main uh, planktivorous birds are the three species of auklets and then the shearwaters. Now the auklets uh, nest primarily in the North Bering Sea. They don't nest up in the Chukchi except for low numbers of, of parakeet auklets. And then we have the shearwaters which actually come up from Australia where they breed and they just come up here to feed. And I did want to point out also that you notice the black box numbered block black boxes there on the maps, those are the Distributed Biological Observatory, which are a series of internationally recognized sampling sites, which uh, a lot of the projects we're involved in will be using or have used. Of course, we have uh, the severe birds, mainly lares and alces. These are tend to be very widespread, but much lower densities than the planktivores. And they do nest in both the North Bering and the Chukchi Sea. Now, if you look at the long-term trends, there's evidence of, you, you can, of course, all the individual species have different patterns in terms of abundance over time. But uh, we've, here I'm looking at just the fish eaters in the North Bering Sea compared to the plankton eaters. And you can see uh, some pretty strong patterns, if we can go back to that. Uh, basically, the North Bering Sea, in the North Bering Sea, the fish eating birds have declined. I won't go back here. Whereas the uh, plankton eaters have increased and since, really since about 2013 or 2015. Okay, but if you pull back and you look at what's happening with these trends, it's not just that they're going down or going up in numbers, but that they might be redistributing across space. Now these maps show changes in distribution for key species. And during the very warm years of 2017 to 2019, this was the warmest period up in the study region compared to the previous decade. So the red colors indicate birds have increased in that cell and the blue colors that they have increased. I'm sorry, the red has increased, the blue has decreased. So the example on the left is thick-billed birds. You can see that they, the blues down below indicate they've gone down in the North Bering Sea, but in fact, they've increased up in the Chukchi Sea. And if you had a, I don't show it here, but the common bird in fact went down all across the board. So it really did appear to have a decline in abundance and it didn't just redistribute. The other example is the least auklet on the right, and in that case, it increased greatly in the Chirikov Basin near its breeding sites. And this coincided with a time when they were not breeding well, they didn't show up at the colonies, or they had very poor reproductive success. So in the past where they might have gone into the, the Chukchi Sea after breeding, they did not do so. The slides are moving on their own. But at any rate, in the <laughs> For the shearwaters, another example, they show very clearly a strong distribution to the north into the Chukchi Sea, even up into the very northern part of the Chukchi Sea. But this uh, increase, this shift northward actually appears to have occurred prior to these three warm years. The graph on the right shows that uh, their abundance increased with latitude really since about 2012, and it's been a steady increase during our, period, our entire period of study. We've also looked at changes in distribution of whole seabird communities. And these are birds that are clustered in space and time together. We've named these clusters by the most predominant species. 
uh, but there includes many species within any of those clusters. And the main thing I wanted to point out with this map showing on the right, the 2017 to 2019, those warm years, uh, I'm pointing out the low density cluster and that didn't have any predominant species. It's extremely low densities of seabirds and it actually expanded quite a bit eastward moving westward uh, while other seabird communities contracted. So what is the attraction north? Well, for one thing, there's evidence that there's more krill and copepods in the Chukchi during summer and fall as we have a longer open water period, warmer water. There are sites with highly aggregated prey on a regular basis that they can, the, the birds can depend on. There's often high, higher quality prey, particularly during cooler years. But there are some conflicting patterns. One thing we see with the warmer water increases is a, gr a growth rate increase in zooplankton. The total biomass greatly expands but it's mostly of, of lower uh, valued prey, lower lipid density prey. So it, it's a trade-off on what the birds are getting with that. There is evidence of stress in the system for the seabirds. Uh, there have been seabird die-offs since about 2013. For the most part, 2017, 18 and 19 were the worst for seabird die-offs noted by residents in the area. Uh, when they've been tested, it's mainly been due to starvation. There are a few cases of evidence of saxitocin in the, in the tissues but nothing that was definitive as a cause of death. These birds appear to be starving. Okay, so there are other important considerations. There's the increase in vessel traffic we're concerned about. That includes not just cargo, but also fishing as the, as the fishing move, effort moves north, military activity and tourism. And one of the things we're doing to examine this is the, a risk assessment project has started led by Northern, Part, Northern Latitude Partners and Aaron Poe is uh, one of the leaders of this effort. That shaded area in the map indicates where we're going, our study area will be, uh, this project has already purchased automatic identification system and we'll be looking at the overlay of seabird distribution and shipping activity to, uh, to help plan for this inevitable issue. So, um, to close, I just want to note that seabirds are involved in a variety of monitoring and assessments for the region. One of them is CAF's State of the Arctic Marine uh, Biodiversity Report that's available online. You can the websites there below. There are also regional projects such as the Arctic Integrated Ecosystem Research Project. Um, a couple that aren't mentioned there, the Distributed Biological Observatory and the Arctic Marine uh, Biodiversity Observing Network up in the Chukchi. But there are, and there are also two uh, integrated ecosystem assessments by ICES, by ICES and PAIN. So it's a lot of acronyms, but uh, that's North Bering Chukchi Sea uh, assessment and the Central Arctic Ocean assessment. So we'll be active in those as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kathy. And we'll hold questions until after we hear from the next speaker. Um, so thank you. Um, and our next speaker is uh, Maria Gavrilo and she is an ornithologist with the Association of Maritime Heritage in St. Petersburg, uh, Russian Federation. Um, and Maria also, like Kathy, has years and decades of working uh, with seabirds and marine mammal populations. Um, she has published over 300 works, including books, reports, and a series of biodiversity maps. And she's currently a national representative to the Circumpolar Seabird Group of CAF. So um, Maria is gonna be talking about Severnaya Zemlia Archipelago, which is a high latitude wildlife refuge in between the two gateways to the Arctic. So go ahead, Maria. Hello, dear colleagues. I'm going to be speaking about the high latitudinal wildlife refuge in the Russian Arctic the Severnaya Zemlya Archipelago. This is a work that took place over many years, but this is a very far-flung region, and we weren't able to carry out monitoring missions, so we c collected our information through rare expeditions to this region. Nevertheless, we do have significant data from this area. The Severnaya Zimla is in the center of 
the this area to the north of the Tymir Peninsula. It's an archipelago made up of four large islands and about 70 smaller ones. An interesting uh, ethnographic element here is the location of this archipelago. As you can see, there's a large uh, shallow water area to the west and to the east, the Laptive Sea comes very close to the uh, the shelf here, and then it becomes quite deep in Laptive Sea. And here we can see a the influence of these elements on the types of birds that are located here. Another important element is that it is equ equidistant from the Pacific and Ar Atlantic gates into the Arctic. These so-called gates into the Arctic are how birds arrive from southern seas and also this from through these gates we see the warming of the arctic ocean and the entire process comes through these two areas this process which we call the or uh, the ecologists already are calling the atlantification of the arctic uh, ocean so what this means is that in Severnaya Zemlya, this archipelago, this is the area that is the furthest from these two gates, and therefore this uh, process or change is taking place uh, later than it is in any other area. So we can see the difference in these different areas. The primary element of this Siberian shelf is a very high level of ice cover in the Lopti Sea and in the Kara Sea, most of the time they are covered by ice. And la in the last century, the it was true that the Kara Sea was called a, a fish-free sea because it was constantly covered with ice. There was too much ice, in fact. A around the Severnaya Zimna archipelago, as you can see here, where the shelf meets with the deeper waters, it's a difficult place to live, but this has led to a greater development in different elements of the birds in this region. I arrived here the first time as a biologist in 1985. And this was the previous climate era, as we would call it. It was very different from what we see today. I then visited several more times, including in 2019, where I carried out a sea expedition that was very broad in scope with 22 specialists and scientists on board. And we carried out some research into the hydrobiology of the area. And we also stepped on land and carried out experiments there. This was an excellent opportunity to compare and evaluate the changes that had taken place over the decades uh, in this area, which is the furthest from the warming ocean from both sides. This archipelago is very far from other elements and therefore it has less effect, uh, less effect has been seen from man-made elements. What we see here are primarily changes and factors based on nature itself. So this is the last geographic uh, area of our planet that has been affected by man. If we look at the fauna of this archipelago, it is primarily Arctic. You see colonies of seabirds. 
you can see them very close to the land itself at the this is uh, a high arctic profile as we can see mostly what we what we will see are the little auk and the ivory gull and you can see that the little auk is primarily in the center island on shallow on the shallower ends of the shelf it's because there is a greater pro concentration of plankton in this area the, this also seen along the cliffs of the edge of the eastern side of the island, we will see a significant increase in bioplankton and therefore you'll see more of this uh, species located there. On the other side of the archipelago, we see a predominance of the ivory gull, which is another significant species for this archipelago. You can see up to 70 or 80 percent of the world's population of this gull is located in this area. This is a very uh, significant uh, bird population for this area of the northern uh, of the Arctic Sea. If we take a look here and if we compare it to those archipelagos that are located along this continental shelf, these, these, the Svalbard Islands, and then Friends Joseph Land, and then you'll see Severnaya Zimlia. And what we can see is the fact that they're so far from both of these gates, the Arctic and Pacific gates, you'll see that there is a decrease in uh, change due to climate uh, and global warming. Here we can see a much broader scope of bird species, as you can see on the screen right now. And we can see that the abundance of breeding seabirds in this area uh, is more significant. What you can see is that if we go from west to east, the number of seabirds drops dramatically. We can also see here that Severna Zemlea tends to have um, fish eating birds and diving birds. We won't see as many pelagic species, those who, which we would see on open seas. And we can see that this means that a decrease in these elements goes a long way to explain why the Kara Sea has been called a sea without fish. Those who uh, are more surface feeder birds, as we can see at the top of this chart, Um, they are known for feeding, uh, having much more uh, a broad scope of feeding, whereas those on the bottom of the chart are focused primarily on plankton. And so this is what we, we saw. We have seen there's a, there's a lack of certain types of food and therefore the species that are seen um, on Svalbard are not seen in Severna Zimla because when they might appear, the sea is covered in ice and there's therefore this ice barrier for the spread of these birds. When we arrived in Severna Zimla in 2019, we saw some changes one interesting uh, element result of our research was the fact that in the last century, this 
species was rarely seen on the archipelago. We would only see one or two birds. They would be approximately from the center of the ar archipelago to about where you see the star on the screen here. That was the largest number of birds that we saw. There we saw several thousand of these birds. It was quite surprising for us. This was a new element for us. A second uh, change that we saw here was the this bird, which was not seen at all on uh, this archipelago. It was seen for the first time. This eider was seen for the first time on these islands in the 90s, but now it is rather widespread throughout the archipelago. And we can see certain areas, even in the very north of the Severnaya Zimlia archipelago. So the largest period portion is where this star is, but we have found it at the very north as well in significant numbers. This uh, eider, common eider generally is seen in areas where there's a very difficult uh, living conditions. And, but here where it used to um, not be seen at all, uh, the changes in water temperature have led to an increase in uh, food sources and therefore the common eider can be found all the way to the north of this archipelago. We studied this issue underwater and the biologists were quite surprised to find out that the underwater life right on the coastal areas of Severnaya Zimlia is very rich and there was food spread uh, food for these birds available at various uh, depths throughout the coastal areas of Severnaya Zimlia. And this was a, quite a surprise for the biologists who were with us. And we only thought to uh, look into this issue due to the eiders being in this area. And we can see here how our seabirds have, have changed. The Franz Josef Land Archipelago, oh, I apologize. Similarly, Zimnia has seen an increase in seven different species, including the common eider. The Vega gull, There are other southern birds who have uh, appeared in the northern areas, including the black guillemot. And also recently, when we see a, a lower level of ice cover, the south of the archipelago has seen a significant increase in different species, including the Western Siberian gull and the ivory gull. So the ecosystem around this archipelago has increased and has been more become more accessible for birds. We have seen this both due to a lack of ice and to an increase in the birds itself. In conclusion, I wanted to say that all these elements are extremely interesting when we're evaluating the changes to marine ecosystems currently. And Severna Zemlia is a unique archipelago with a pristine ecosystem one that could be used as a natural laboratory, learning of how man-made effects will change this archipelago. And once again, 
what I wanted to say with these three archipelagos, Svalbard Islands, Franz Josef Land, and Severna Zimlea, all along the continental shelf. This is an extremely interesting na um, natural area. We have discussed this in a, in a seminar, and uh, our research supports these archipelagos being included in UNESCO's World Heritage uh, System. In conclusion, I want to thank, of course, all of my colleagues who are on the expedition with me because working in such uh, far-flung conditions uh, was very difficult. We needed an excellent team and they were all wonderful. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maria, very much. Um, it's now we have a little bit less time. We have about um, six minutes or so for um, six or seven minutes for questions. And if you could put those in the chat, or you can also raise your hand if you would like to ask verbally, although I don't think I can see everybody with their hand raised. So I'm going to have to ask others to help me um, there. And maybe while we're waiting for a question, maybe I will just ask Kathy, now that you're taking a drink of coffee or something, <laughs> um, what your thoughts are on the differences between what you're seeing um, in the Bering Sea and the Chukchi um, versus what Maria is seeing. Um, clearly two very different ecosystems there, but are there any connections or any kind of um, things that really struck you? and Maria's presentation. Yeah, it's an interesting comparison. Um, first of all, just seeing the increase uh, in, in species, the more species coming up for longer periods and higher numbers of certain species, you're seeing similar uh, patterns up in the Chukchi, North Bering Chukchi. I'm thinking mainly of the Chukchi, but that's, um, it, it's even, uh, more extreme, I think, in my, my just my impression right now in the Chukchi, and that the the ice has disappeared much more rapidly. It appears like this, and um, the area that Maria spoke of is is much more um, is going to be more of a long term change. It's much more uh, ice bound still. There's a little bit of an of a similar situation in the Chukchi around the Hannah Shoal area, which is a shallow shelf in the Chukchi that retained ice, used to anyway, retain, retained ice into the summer, whereas other areas lost it early. So uh, this is a smaller example of that, but it, it's very, it'll be very interesting to follow the, the patterns that are happening up in Zimlia. And um, I see that, um, well, that, that's mainly it. I think it's, it appears to be, my impression is it looks like it, things are happening quicker in the Chukchi, but a similar process. Similar process, thanks. Uh, we do have a question for Maria from George DeVoki. Uh, do the seabirds breeding on the archipelago winter in the Pacific or the Atlantic? Uh, uh, thank you, George, for the question. Uh, uh, the Severn Zimla is the easternmost eastern border for many species, like uh, little ox are on the eastern border uh, and uh, we have no direct data. We have no uh, tracking data for the for the seabirds, but we suppose that the most uh, uh, winter in Atlantic, and for the for the ivory gull, we do have some uh, tracking data, and they go both to the uh, either to Atlantic or to Pacific to winter, or they can switch between. And the most interesting question uh, would be regarding kitty wake, because we found that kitty wakes from because the Western colony in Nova Zimlia, they go to Pacific as well. And now we are really looking forward to make a research on the migration of Kittyway. They are supposed to winter in Atlantic, but I believe that some, some girls, they might go to Pacific. That's Great, the, thank you. There was also a question. What was the species of the rare bird that you mentioned seeing an increase in before the common eider? Was that, the question was, was that a phalarope? Do you remember which one that was? It's the rare bird. 
Yeah, it uh, red red fella rope. Red fella rope. Okay, thank you. And then um, Alexander Kijaiski has um, his hand up, and um, go ahead, Alexander, and ask your question. So first, it's a question for you. Should it be in English, in Russian? Translation goes for the questions as well. Um, yes, we translate the questions as well. All right, I will start with the easy one in English for Kathy Kulitz. Um, Kathy, really a nice presentation. I, I just I wanted to um, to add that based on our study, relatively long term, starting in, in 2016, 15, even some data. Uh, those changes that you attributed to this warming and the lack of ice, not necessarily consistent um, across all the years. For example, 2017, the year that you included as one of the warm years in your presentation, uh, that was one of the best years for uh, least and crested oaklets breeding on um, St. Lawrence Island. And yet, as you, as you know, uh, Neocalinus copepods disappeared in that year too. So we still, although it's very reputable um, long time series, but there is so much intraannual variability that I, I would be uh, making somewhat cautionary note on generalizing that it's all because the warming and everything else. Um, so it's just it's just a note. Uh, a question for Maria. Um, so no question for you, Kathy. <laughs> just a comment. <laughs> I, was going to say, I, I agree. I, I went, things were combined to look at sort of a big picture. And yes, there are certainly, we see them in the individual patterns, um, exceptions and, and blips. Uh, but that, that still was the general pattern. Um, in addition to and information we heard about the diomedes too. So, thank you. Thanks. And Alexander, we only have a, about 30 seconds to a minute. So if you could do a, a question. <laughs> Did you have one more for Maria? I'm mute. Oh. Sasha. Uh -huh. Uh, Maria, so uh, just a couple of words. What the uh, merge doing? Take the merge um, on this and and little ox. Uh, any idea about their numbers? Have they changed between the two? You know, states that you observed them there. Uh, sorry, we have no any data on numbers of little ox in the area. So they they breed uh, in a, in a not on the screes, uh, on, on in, the, in the crevices, and it's really no it, it guess, guesstimate. It's not possible, unfortunately, to say about the population trend in little oaks. Okay. And there are no there are no mirrors. So no common mirrors, no thick bill mirrors. No, no. It's it's uh, the mirror is the thick bill mirror is the rare vagrant to the area only. Uh, okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Maria. And I'm just going to give you one last quick question and whether uh, there is an issue with ship traffic in the archipelago. Is that an issue at all? Uh, well, the, the busy ship route is going just beyond, I mean, south of the archipelago. And some, some ships are going uh, far north off, north through the archipelago. It's also remote of the shipping. Okay, thank you. Thank you both to you and Kathy for those um, presentations. So we're going to move on to our next um, session, which is um, looking at um, the Aleutians and the Pribilofs and the Commander Islands. Um, and our first speaker is Lauren Devine, who is the Director of the Ecosystem Conservation Office with the Alliot Community of St. Paul Island. And Lauren also is very instrumental in starting um, and expanding the Indigenous Sentinels Network, which is a grassroots environmental monitoring framework that enables tribes uh, to take more control and have a stronger voice in monitoring for climate change. Um, and she is currently working on trying to expand that to Russia as well. So Lauren is going to be speaking about seabird research and monitoring in the Pribilof Islands. 
So go ahead, Lauren. Thank you so much. I, I'm keeping this very brief as I only have 10 minutes. So I'm going to just highlight a few selected monitoring activities, um, selected research projects that we have ongoing. And um, I was asked to provide just a slide uh, around potential for increased uh, collaborations and communications across our borders. We are located in the Pripyloff Islands. I work for the Aleut community of St. Paul Island, which is the northernmost of two inhabited islands, St. Paul and St. George in the middle of the Bering Sea. Some of the monitoring activities that we do, we've been long standing participants in a citizen science uh, program called the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team or COAST. Now, COAST allows us to monitor our beaches at regular intervals and be able to assess presence and absence of various seabird species. Um, what this has given us is a long uh, historical database or um, data set of when we expect to see seabirds wash in, beached birds, um, and allows us to, in recent years, be able to detect unusual mass mortality events or die-off events. In fact, with this program, we were able to develop a die-off alert protocol that's been widely implemented in recent years with the increasing frequency of seabird die-offs. We had a tufted puffin die-off in 2016, and every year following that through 2019, we had various species um, that were experiencing mass mortality events we heard um, from Dr. Kulitz about the starvation was mostly um, responsible for those die-offs in our ecosystem. So I provided just a couple of maps here that show you um, how our uh, participation in this program allows us to have a long-term data set that can be used regionally and statewide, um, even across the US-Russia border to determine the health of the ecosystem and then you know, more particularly of the seabird species that we have breeding and feeding on the islands. So this gives us a, a great broader context uh, and is a, a great monitoring activity that we've been part of for quite a while. We also implement wintering sea duck and gull surveys. We have temporary seasonable, seasonal agency biologists that um, come to St. Paul and St. George and perform uh, summer productivity uh, research on our islands. However, they're only there for a small portion of the year. And so we utilize our local resident employees with our tribal government uh, to implement regular surveys of overwintering sea duck and gulls. And here I've provided um, some information for you. It's pretty simple. We're taking numbers of various species. Uh, here I have harlequin ducks, king eiders, and long-tailed ducks pictured uh, in the top corner. You can see over time, we are able to detect uh, mean abundances or numbers of birds over time. And what we found is that this was a gap in um, information. We really didn't know anything about the overwintering sea duck and gulls. And implementing this survey has filled a pretty critical gap um, so that we are monitoring uh, our bird species throughout time and all across the year for, for year round surveys. Here you can see um, a few different species that are occurring in low abundances, but what I want to draw your attention to is from the previous um, three species that I presented where we have consistent presence over time, we do see some uh, more unusual species or declines in species over time. You can see Stellar's eiders have um, dropped out of our surveys uh, where they were more commonly seen uh, in 2008, 2011, 2012. Now we don't see them anymore. That's um, the same for our common eider species and some of our other um, duck species. We're also keenly interested in looking at uh, the health of the ecosystem as it pertains to our seabird populations and sustaining those populations through um, their prey bases. And so we've been able to pull together some information around foraging areas for various species. And all of this information really plays into our tribe's efforts for marine conservation. So we're looking at the ecosystem as a whole. We know that seabirds are important ecosystem indicators, and it's really important to understand the differences in foraging ecology um, for the seabirds that occupy our islands and are common um, you know, in, in our backyards. 
And here I have thick build MERS and you can see, um, we see pretty localized feeding areas for these birds, meaning they're foraging um, during the breeding season close to the island um, uh, on the shelf on St. George, which is to the south, the orange um, polygon there, they're feeding maybe more off to uh, towards the slope into deeper waters. But for St. Paul, we're seeing a very restricted range. This is interesting because we can compare that with something uh, like the black-legged kittiwakes that are foraging all over the shelf onto the slope and off the um, the slope into the basin to deeper waters. I've highlighted the 30 nautical mile and 100 nautical mile um, boundaries because this is kind of the area that we look at as our Pribilof Islands ecosystem. And we know how important it is to um, look at some of these very long ranging species that occupy a lot of our areas um, for those of us that are on this call and, and are important on, on both sides. Um, there are species that we share. And so we are focused in on our region, on our, you know, what we would say is the Purple Off Islands kind of marine ecosystem, but we also are keen to, um, to look at how this uh, ecosystem fits into the broader context of the Arctic. And so understanding and knowing um, what species are feeding where and where they go when they leave our shores, uh, as these birds are not present year round, um, but these are birds that we see during the summer breeding season is really important for us on a, from a research standpoint. We like to do um, some combination of Western science, very quantitative, abundance-based, um, you know, numbers type data collection for our seabird research. We also like to pull and keep our communities very involved in the research that we're doing. And one of the ways that we do this is looking at community knowledge of seabirds. So recently we completed a study to look at and interview our subsistence hunters for red-legged kittiwakes. Our communities are subsistence hunters of red-legged kittiwakes and not black-legged kittiwakes, although both species occur on the islands of St. Paul and St. George. And we looked at the information that we gathered from these social um, interview processes with abundance numbers over time that have been collected from um, our agency partners with the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. What we've found is, is that between our islands, we do have things that are similar and we have uh, kind of different trajectories for um, the information of our hunters. So for instance, on St. George, the hunters were able to verify with our quantitative data that the population of red-legged kittiwakes seems to be stabilizing or increasing over time. Whereas St. Paul hunters correctly or similarly um, projected that the species is in decline. And that is in fact what we see with the quantitative data that we have. Uh, some of those reasons may have been linked in their minds to a shortage of food, which indeed we see uh, climate changes in general, such as warming waters and changes that are associated with changing prey distributions uh, with those warming waters and perhaps with overhunting. So um, there's, there's not good record keeping of the subsistence hunting of kitty wakes over time. Um, and so hunters said perhaps that overhunting may be contributing to that, but it's, it's likely due to multiple uh, stressors. St. Paul hunters also report that they were indicating a, an arrival of kitty wakes each year was coming earlier and earlier. And this was related to uh, hearing them earlier, seeing the birds carrying uh, bits of grass and um, stuff to make nests with on the um, cliffs. And this really was confirmed with recent data collection um, and comparable historical data. So we are seeing early arrival of some of our bird species. And that's being observed in the community by those um, users of these different bird species. Oh, I double clicked. <laughs> and I've lost my, there we go. Um, I just wanna note that everything that we do is really done from the standpoint of uh, our community in mind. So we are very keen to address food security issues and to work towards food security for our communities. 
a lot of what we do is bringing in youth um, to our activities, whether that is preparing wings for educational mounts, taking students out in the field on coast surveys, doing laboratory type work with um, seabird carcasses. We are involved with the subsistence activities such as collecting uh, mer eggs and kitty wake hunting. We also operate a rat prevention program, which is central to protecting our seabird species on island. So uh, everything Thing that we do monitoring and research wise is done with the community in mind. The last thing that I just want to mention is I think there are a lot of potential um, collaborations and increased communication opportunities. I mentioned the die off program that we helped create with COAST and implementing something like the citizen science um, surveys more widely, even across our borders, is something that I would love to see uh, more of. And also complementary surveys anywhere that we can share protocols for uh, detecting seasonal abundances and counting seabird species, uh, or coordinating some monitoring activities more broadly across uh, communities. We also hosted uh, several students from MedMe um, through the Seabird Youth Network, which has been a really strong um, program for our youth and our um, Russian family members on um, the Commander Islands. And we would love to see more exchange on uh, both ways for, for that program. We're also interested in any kind of educational activities or tangentially related things like marine debris and plastics or contaminants work. So I think there are a lot of ways which we could um, collaborate as communities um, in this type of work. And with that, I will say, uh, or thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Lauren. Really appreciate that. Um, on our agenda, we have a, a short two minute update from Heather Renner from the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. Um, Heather, are you on the line? We didn't see you in the list of participants. Can you speak up if you are? It sounds like you may not have, ha you might have had a family emergency. So um, I know you had a, um, yeah, or speak up in the chat if you are here and we can't hear Molly, you. Molly, yes. she, she was not able to join us. So if she's able to come into the last minute, we will, we can, we can squeeze her in, but otherwise okay. we'll go on to uh, okay. the next one. All right, we'll just move on then. And our next speaker is Dimitri Pilipenko. Uh, who is an ornithologist and head of the science department for the Commander Islands Nature and Biosphere Reserve. Um, and Dimitri will be speaking about colonial seabirds of the Commander Islands. So welcome, Dimitri. Good afternoon, colleagues. Yes, I'm gonna be speaking about colonial seabirds on the Commander Islands. Just one minute here. Oh. So the Commander Islands are fully incorporated into the Commander Islands Reserve, which is an area of more than 3.5 million hectares, of which a little more than uh, 185,000 are land and the rest are the waters around the islands themselves. It's one of the largest reserves in Russia and one of the lar is the largest uh, reserve in the Bering Sea. It was included in the UNESCO uh, list recently and is currently functioning as a national park. Currently, the nature reserve includes 20 species of birds. There are seabird colonies on all four islands. On Bering Island, they are located, oh, I apologize, to begin again. On Bering Island, they are located mainly in the southern part. On Medney Island, they're dotted along the entire coast while uh, Toparkov and Arikaiman Islands are almost fully occupied by birds. 
the last full inventory of the colonies took place more than 20 years ago. But our research took place between 2015 and 2020. During this time, all of the islands on the archipelago were surveyed and most species were counted. According to data from the late 20th century, a bit more, just one minute, please. I'm having a bit of trouble with the slides. So there are slightly more than 72,000 pairs of Northern Fulmar on the Bering Island. And on the Mending Island, there's about 121,000 pairs. We were unable to uh, gather enough data on the number of fork-tailed storm petrels and leech storm petrels, but both species do occur on both uh, the islands of the archipelago. We don't have full current data on these, but we agree with the opinion that we have seen from previous researchers, that is probably more than 1,000 pairs of each of these species of petrels. The situation with cormorants is very interesting here. In previous decades, the number of pelagic cormorant was higher than that of red-faced cormorants, but currently the opposite is true. The number of registered red-faced cormorants is higher on all of the islands except for Bering Island. On Medney Island, in 2017, more than, why? Oh, the slides do seem to keep skipping. Let me repeat myself. On Medney Island 2017, there were more than 2,000 pairs of red-faced cormorants, but only 284 pairs of pelagic cormorants. And on Bering Island in 2018, there were only 25 pairs of red-faced cormorants against 690 pairs of pelagic cormorants. We should note here that in recent years, there's been a decline in the overall number of cormorants. For example, in 2018, only three pairs of each species nested on Ari Kaiman Island. And in 2019, the red-faced cormorant did not nest on Toporkov Island at all, and there were only 15 pairs of pelagic cormorants. Although in previous years, the red-faced cormorant had been in the majority there. In 2020, the situation began to equalize and we counted more than 200 pairs of both species on Ari Kaiman Island. The number of glaucous gulls is generally stable on Bering Island and Toparkov Island. In the first case, in 2018, 125 pairs were counted, but in the second case, in 2019, just over 3,000 pairs were counted. The number has slightly increased on Medne Island to 730 pairs, but decreased significantly on Ari Kaiman Island to 144 pairs in 2020. The number of black legged kitty weights decreased on Bering Island and Toprakov Island and now amount to 16,000 pairs on Bering Island and 13 pairs on Toprakov Island, respectively. We also record, recorded a small increase on Eri Kaiman Island in 2016. But with red leg kitty weights, we're seeing the, that the opposite is true. On Bering Island, their numbers have increased and they now make up approximately 22,000 pairs. And in fact, most of the species that can be found on the Commander Islands is, is concentrated here on Bering Island, approximately 97% of the total number. The numbers on Medne Island are fairly stable. According to data from 2017, there are 528 pairs. And on Ari Kaiman and Toparkov Islands, the number of nesting birds decreased to 161 pairs on Ari Kaiman and between eight and 13 pairs on Toprakov Islands. 
The number of two species of gill of moor have increased significantly in recent decades. They nest on the all the islands except for Tuprakov Island. I'm not sure what happened here. I seem to have lost my slides. Do we need to go back a slide? Ah, this is where I need to be. Yes, thank you. <laughs> On Bering Island, the number of common mirror has almost doubled and now amounts to more than 26,000 birds. The number of thick-billed mirror has increased almost two and a half fold to more than 96,000 birds. Medney Island hasn't seen significant changes in the number of thick-billed mirrors. We've counted approximately 33,000 birds, but the number of common mirror tripled to approximately 58,000 birds. On Arikamen Island, there was a minimal increase in the number of common mirror. Approximately 17,000 birds nest there. And the thick-billed mirror has reduced its numbers almost six-fold. We counted 135 birds in 2016, but that was only approximately 0.1% of the commander population. The number of pigeon game numbers on Bering and Medney Islands has remained virtually unchanged and is currently uh, 1,084 birds on Bering Island and 588 on Medney Island. On Chorapokov and Arikamen Islands, they've de decreased with a particularly significant decrease on Taparkov Island from 500 to 20. Something seems to have gone wrong. Can we go back, Can we go back again, Stephanie? Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I Do just need to, to find the right slide here. Is this the right one? It's the last one you were on. Did you have any any other things, Dimitri? Do you need to go back to the last slide? Da, da, da. Yes. Yeah. yes, please. Can we go back, Stephanie, or not? Yes, or could you please help me out? Yeah. I think the problem is when you click too many times, you have to click once and that's it. And don't click again. Okay, go ahead. Hang on, I seem to be, I haven't been able to find this slide. He can't see it on the screen. Well, this isn't the last slide. Okay, well, I'll just describe the end of the the presentation. So in recent years, we have seen uh, different types of uh, auklets and merlets. We have seen that most of the crested auklets were seen on Medney and Arik Islands. The whiskered auklet is seen on Medney Island and the least auklet used to nest on Tarapov Island, but we haven't seen it there, but we have seen at least one pair on Medney Island. We have seen a threefold increase in the uh, parakeets auklets on Arikainen Island, where we counted up to a thousand birds. Most of the nesting puff, tufted puffins that we see are concentrated on the island of the same name. Taparkov is tufted puffin in Russian. According to latest surfies, approximately 54,000 pairs are here. And uh, we have seen an Similar number on the Arikaiman Island. It has remained practically unchanged and numbers increased slightly on Medney Island, but decreased on the Bering's Island. 
And we have seen uh, similar data to that of the late 20th century uh, when we look at the northern Fulmar population, which is estimated at approximately 500,000 pairs. And over the last 20, 30 years for the archipelago, the number of red leg kitty weight has increased 1.3 fold, common mirror by two fold, and thick billed mirror uh, also approximately two fold. The number of black leg kitty weight and tufted puffins are stable, but the number of crested auglet, pyrochete auglet, and glaucus gull have seen no significant decrease or increase. Over the past six years, we have seen fluctuations in the abundance of two cormorant species here as well. There is an aqua uh, protection zone surrounding the island, which has uh, helped to maintain the uh, level of bird species here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Unfortunately, it, it would seem that not all my slides made it into the presentation. Um, well, we apologize for that. Um, whatever happened there, Dimitri, I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, we do have some time now for a few questions and um, be sure to put them in the chat or raise your hand. And I know we do have one question, just curious whether you have seen uh, bird die-offs on the Commander Islands, such as the ones seen um, in the Pribilofs. No, I wouldn't say so. For the majority of these key species that I listed, uh, we would see an increase rather than a decrease in, in all of these species. Okay. Um, Lauren, maybe you could comment real briefly on what you see as kind of the differences um, happening between the Pribilofs and the commanders. Certainly the die-offs is a difference, isn't it? I can cer certainly, absolutely. So yes, we've seen die-offs that have included tufted puffins, uh, northern fulmars, shearwaters, and um, kittiwakes, black and red-legged kittiwakes. Um, I do think it's interesting to note that our one of our kind of iconic species in the Pribilofs is the red-faced cormorant. It's not one that gets a lot of attention um, for the suite of seabirds that we do have. Uh, we typically have um, long-term data sets from the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge for puffins, mers, a little bit for puffins, uh, mers, and auklets, and the kittiwakes are the most kind of attention is paid to those species, but we've been noting that red-faced cormorants have been finding um, various places to nest on the islands that they haven't, they're not traditionally found in one or another location. They, they can be found kind of in different locations in different years, um, sometimes very abundant, sometimes not abundant at all. Uh, and we have been trying to find them and, and seek them out for long-term monitoring because we're seeing more and more incorporation of plastics into their nests. And we just don't have a lot of information on if they're ingesting the plastics um, and, uh, or if they're just incorporating them into the nests, if, if it's in the tissues or, or eggs or you know what potential impacts might be there. But um, I, I I think we do share uh, a lot of species in common for our breeding species. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I'll ask Dimitri then um, uh, a couple of questions. Are there wintertime surveys conducted at the Commander Islands? Yes, we do carry out surveys in winter time, uh, primarily taking a look at uh, goose species. And we recently carried a survey out. We take a look at 15 to 17 types of, of uh, goose. This is mostly on Bering Island because uh, nav navigation is closed to the other islands at that time. And we did have a survey that we carried out in 2019 as well. And I'm gonna call on uh, Deanna Solovoy right now because I think there was a question with the translation of my bird die-off question. 
And Deanna, do you want to go ahead? I think someone has to unmute you, but you can ask. You have your hand raised. And I see Kathy Kulitz after that. Deanna? The question wasn't about extinction. It was about die-offs. So have you seen any, any mass die-offs of birds? And do you carry out any surveys about these birds? Well, yeah, I understood the question. We have, have not seen any mass die-offs of birds. There, there have been specific times where we've seen one or two birds, but these uh, mass die-offs have not been seen in the Commander Islands. Okay, no large scale die-offs. Okay, um, we're um, out of time here for the Q&A. Just real quickly, um, I know Kathy and Alex both had their hands raised. Is this something you can ask later or do you wanna ask it now? Uh, not so much a question, just a note that it might be good to, it'd be very interesting to compare increases or decreases between our, you know, the Eastern side of this study area and the, and the, the Western Russian side. Um, because of indications we have from that sea data that birds aren't just moving north, but that they're, if not increasing, at least remaining stable on the west side of this, of these seas. So I, I think we might be seeing some shift in distribution that way. Great, thank you. And Alex, did you have a one quick question? And if not, we'll... Move on. Uh, just, just very quick question about you. You didn't have time. Um, Dmitry, спасибо. Вы хорошо представили. Dmitry, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. You brought up a, a decrease in the uh, ancient murrelet. Could you comment on this? I'm sorry. I, I only heard uh, ancient murrelet, and I didn't hear anything after that. Oh, yes. Could you comment on, on the decrease in birds there? Well, the number of this particular bird has been decreasing, but it has always been a very small number of birds. It's only been a couple hundred. So this isn't something significant. So if, if you want me to, to comment on it, well, it's not really something I can talk very much about. Ah. I understand, says Alexander. Thank you. That's enough. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Um, we're going to move on to our next session. And, um, and just a reminder to the next two speakers that when you're clicking slides, click it once and wait. Don't, if you click it twice, it's going to skip and go to the next two slides. So click it once and wait before you mm -hmm. um, and the slide should appear. So our next speaker is uh, Deanna um, Solovayova, and she is an ornithologist and a senior researcher with the Institute for Biological Problems of the North in Magadan, Russia. And she will be speaking about trends in Beringian seabirds as revealed from breeding surveys in the Chukotka tundra. So Deanna, um, go ahead. Доброго времени суток, уважаемые коллеги, и сейчас я хочу рассказать о тех же Good afternoon, colleagues. There's quite an echo on this speaker. It's very difficult to hear her, but I will do my best. I think everyone needs to mute themselves if they're not muted, except the speakers. Go ahead. Uh, 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 Here I'm showing a map from the database on Arctic birds where we can see all the data that has been collected on various types of birds. There is still very difficult with the echo that I'm hearing. We're taking a look here at the Chukotka coast and the types of birds that we see in this area. 
at sometimes the birds are seen only for a very short period of time. The interpreter apologizes. It is impossible to, to interpret this. I'm very, very sorry. If we could pause, Deanna, please. Deanna, could you pause? And are you on a phone and a computer? Because that might be the problem if you have two open. Yes. Yeah. Or turn down your microphone on yeah. your computer. No, I'm not wearing headphones, she says. Does anyone else have a suggestion on the echo? <laughs> She's going to try a headset. Okay, thanks. I don't have one, but my uh, graduate student has one. Perhaps I should turn down the sound? We could try it. Well, I don't think it's working. Any other suggestions, Jill or Stephanie? Usually it's when there are two devices on. Yes, um, I would make sure that nothing else is on. If her student is nearby and listening in, we could be hearing an echo. Right, if someone else is close by, you might be getting an echo from theirs as well. Uh, is this any better? Could you turn off your computer speaker? Uh, I don't know how to do this. How would I turn off the speakers on, on my computer? Uh, if you go to settings in your computer, I don't know what kind of computer she has. Over the speaker icon, over and hover. I just bought this computer and I'm not really sure how it works. <laughs> the speaker icon on the bottom right of the screen. Mine doesn't have one there, so I wouldn't know to go Me there. <laughs> Audio settings in the webinar, bottom left of the screen, where you have your microphone. Mm -hmm. On the bottom left of the screen, no, where it's Yes, the I microphone. see my microphone. And then if you go to uh, select a speaker, Which one would be clicked off? <laughs> so my headphones are on, it would seem. That's what's chosen right now. They've chosen my headphones. It says, select a microphone, select headphones. So what, what is the suggestion here? I'm not a technical person, so I'm looking Hoping others. If she could share her screen, we might be able to see what we can do to help her, but without seeing what options she has, it's very difficult to make suggestions. Yeah. Is there some chance she's in a room that is echoing? I think this is a bad echo. So I think it's worse. <laughs> I don't think it's just a room. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. May I suggest that we might need to move on to Tula, Tula Holman's update. And um, if we can't get the audio worked mm -hmm. out with Deanna, then we might need to just move on to the question and answer. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Do you want to, um, do we want to have her just click through the slides really quickly? Um, I, and we can live with the echo, except the interpreter cannot, but we could at least get 
the Russians could hear it, but we wouldn't hear it in English. Why don't we why don't we do that? Just click through the slides real quickly and go to Tula and then go to questions. Does that make sense? Do we want her to click through them or do we want one of us? Well, if she can't speak because we can't hear. <laughs> well, is this okay if I speak English? Because I believe most of my the echo's gone. The echo's gone yeah. in English. Go ahead, Deanna. Speak in English. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Well, so I miss sometimes. So I, I miss the slide and I try to go to the next one, but I don't know where it disappeared. Uh, okay, so our methods uh, are pretty consistent with patient wildlife service uh, methods used for Yukon Delta and maybe other Alaskan camps in flat tundra. So we start our project as a part of spectacle either monitoring project and we selected 40 one kilometer one square kilometer plots and uh, we tried to uh, later when we start the build monitoring project we pick up um, nine of them out of gull colonies and we try to search them within 10 days interval and Two persons were devoted to search for one plot and gull colonies that it separately by either visual counts of in the flat under or by drone later. Uh, 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 since 2012, we start recording daily species list, which um, give us abundance or species index. It's quite easy. Everybody after the working day report the number of birds by species they see during the day and then we calculate this relative abundance index. Uh, what do we have by now? Uh, you can see on the left side, uh, the bars represent the nesting density in nest per square kilometer and the um, left axis or as a line represents the relative abundance. And for loons, we have pretty stable or even increasing if consider the observation or abundant, abundance rank uh, in both large loons, I mean, Arctic loon and yellow bill loon. And we have decline of Pacific loon, but this decline happened after the uh, somehow documented increase between the cold times, I mean the historical observations in our site in 70s, 80s, and up to the year 2000s. Uh, so the loons increased in number, and now we report decline, some decline in Pacific loon in nesting density. Uh, we attribute this decline to the increasing predation pressure by the increased number of predators, red foxes, brown bears, wolverine, became regular and common predators in our area with the climate change. Well, if you go to the next slide, we can see even more dramatic pictures, Sabian's gun. In opposite to what Maria said, uh, the good news from Severna Zemlya, we have the completely opposite story. All Sabian's gull disappeared from Chown Delta by the two years ago. And you can see that in historical times, our colleagues study mostly Laros gull colonies. So they don't concentrate on the plot search like we do. They try to record the number of birds and colonies. And they have some colonies. They are of different color, you see, which we never had for Sabian's gull. When we start our work in the 2002 and continue, we did not see the same colonies. All sevens disappeared. We saw the last pair of sevens and on this colony number five. And the only one colony monitoring through the years was this red one, the colony number seven, which is close to the station. 
And this one was the last one actually um, active, and now it's gone. So we lost all our spec um, savings girls during our study. Not really good. And spec idea, our the most in species which we are concentrated and our most concern. And you can see the stable period of the number and then dramatic decline right now. Uh, you may know that the, um, there are several camps in Alaska which monitor this threatened species. And there is only one camp in Russia, this is our Kion camp, which monitors the species in Russia. And also considerations that there is different tendencies in Alaskan population, but there is some big Russian population doing well and the species survival is secured just because the Russian population, it's not true. The only camp which observes spec IDAS in Russia shows a dramatic decline in the last years. And we publish a paper, it's shown down. And you can see that it's pretty consistent with the abundance index. The number of uh, nests per kilometer and abundance index are going together down. Uh, Larus gulls, it's quite interesting because the, what we see now is the nest density of Lars Vega and Glaucus gull, Lars Viperperos, is going down if we count only solitary nesting birds. I mean, the birds nesting on the plots out of gull colonies. But the gull colonies are increasing, at least they were increasing five years ago. I, I didn't process the data from the last years, but uh, it seems that large gulls switch from the solitary nesting to the nesting in colonies. And I suggest this is a result of increasing pressure of predators. Solitary nesting is now not profitable. And so they move to the colonies. But colonies instead have some restrictions because the sites where colonies could be, like islands in the lakes, uh, they have limited space, so uh, soon I expect we will see the saturation of colonies and then switch to, uh, I don't know, other areas. Okay, and our, our la last group of uh, birds is phalarops, uh, which historically uh, have been nesting in quite a number. And the red phalarop is again the species of concern because in 80s, in the cold times, uh, there were about more than 10 nests per square kilometer. During our times, we did not see any nests during 10 years. And then in the last years, we start getting them back again, but in a very low density. It's less than half a nest per square kilometer. But redneck phalarop uh, was doing well in the previous, in the cold times, from 10 to 35 nests. And now we have the same, about the same density. So it's pretty good right now. And so I want to acknowledge the funding and support from US Fish and Wildlife Service and Steve Collin person for spectacle tile the project and uh, our bird community monitoring was supported by WCS Beringia program and the later years we received support from Chinese Academy of Science uh, from a different tracking project and uh, we appreciate logistic and transportation by King Rose Gold company that help us pretty much okay thank you thank you very much for that Diana um we're going to go next to a really short update from Tula Holman, um, who is a seabird researcher with University of Alaska Fairbanks and the Alaska Sea Life Center. Tula? We had your slides. <laughs> Are you on, Tula? OK, I think I just unmuted. Can you hear me yes, now? I can hear you now. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Molly, for the introduction and good afternoon and good evening and good morning, everyone. So I um, want to thank uh, you for the opportunity to offer this brief update 
on some recent and ongoing work with spectacled and stellar eiders, two species that are listed as threatened in the United States. And uh, I only have one slide, so I'm not going to have the slide advanced problem. <laughs> but uh, the um, wanted to just first um, uh, talk a little bit about a recent project we completed um, working on wintering ecology of spectacled eiders. The world population of the species overwinters in the Bering Sea, historically sound, south of St. Lawrence Island in pack ice leads. And there the eiders are uh, closely associated with sea ice, which provides a platform for resting and also the ice um, is important for um, boosting productivity and food availability of the marine system where the eiders are foraging. And so to understand possible impacts of the um, observed declines in sea ice in this area on eider survival, we analyzed a 23-year uh, mark recapture data set from an eider nesting area in Western Alaska. And in this analysis, we found evidence uh, for a nonlinear effect of sea ice conditions in such a way that spectacle guider survival declined at both extremes of the ice spectrum. And uh, also finding evidence that the intermediate or moderate sea ice concentrations were optimal for survival, overwinter survival. And uh, I want to mention that at the low end of the spectrum, the, um, there's considerable uncertainty because we only had a small number of years with low ice conditions or what we call water years in this analysis, but there is ongoing work to continue data collection and, um, and repeat this analysis in future years. And recently these findings were published in uh, ecology and evolution, and I'd be happy to provide a reference for that publication for anyone interested. And then the second study I'd like to mention is a new project that we just started just before the pandemic. So we've done one year now and had to cancel the season last year, but hopefully we'll be able to continue this year. It's a it's work investigating habitat conditions of stellar cider molting lagoons in Southwest Alaska, where a large proportion of the entire Pacific population concentrates to molt during the four months. And the overall goal of this multi-year project is to evaluate if habitat conditions have changed and if habitat change is associated with changes in the numbers, timing of molt or distribution of eiders. So we hope to learn if prey communities and biomass of available prey has changed over time, if either body condition has changed over time, and if these changes are associated with changes in phenology numbers or distribution of stellar ciders in the Southwest Alaska area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tula, I appreciate that. So we do have um, maybe 10 minutes or so for some questions here. Um, and specifically for Deanna Tula, but also for other speakers. And be sure to put them in the chat or raise your hand. And um, we do have a question from Lee Cooper asking about um, ideas about the causes of the spectacled eider declines. And I think this was specifically directed to Deanna. Well, so again, I don't know if my speaker is too loud. Well, uh, the only we can say is increasing predation and uh, it's associated with Vega gulls increasing dramatically in our area and also our mammalian predators. So now the recruitment of speckled eiders, I'm sorry, I mispronounced the name in English, is very low during the low productivity years. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for Dimitri and Deanna. Um, do you see shipping vessel traffic as being a factor that influences the birds in your regions? Uh, 
Dimitri, mm -hmm. do you want to go first? Yes, I can answer. The fact of the matter is we have no shipping in our area because we are a nature reserve. So they're just, they just don't come anywhere near us. They're not allowed to. It would be a violation of the uh, protocols in place. Okay, so a marine protected area with a preserve there. Um, and how about Deanna? Uh, well, they are situated too far away from marine routes. Uh, Chown Delta is pretty deep. It's Chown Bay. And so the bay is not used for shipping. Okay, so it seems like at least direct shipping may not have, um, have an impact. Um, Kathy Coolis, you have your hand up. Uh, well, yes, I was actually going to bring up the issue of shipping, at least to the Bering Strait region. Uh, I think it could be, a, uh, could be a significant impact on some populations that pass through there in that area. The shipping has increased more during the darker month and with the light, with the light um, um, increase in traffic, I, it could be, it could be a, a source of mortality, right? not, not trivial. Um, and, and what would cause the mortality, Kathy? Just Excuse the, me? What, what, what is the direct cause of the mortality? The birds appear to be attracted or, or disoriented by lights, especially during darkness or storm. And so they they hit the vessels and break wings and necks and such. And we, we know that this happens and there have been studies shown in Greenland uh, and Iceland. Um, and it certainly happened in the Bering Sea. And now we're having some records of it occurring in the Bering Strait region with uh, very large ships, very well lit up and traveling during winter months more now, late fall, winter months. So it's, it's a, issue in other areas. And I think in, in choke points like the Bering Strait, it could be uh, an issue, my opinion. Mm -hmm. Any Anyone want to comment on that from your perspective or your regions? Okay. Um, is, uh, what, if you, if you had the opportunity to uh, collaborate more, what would, um, what kinds of things would you like to do with between U.S. and Russia if you were able to collaborate more easily? Maybe I'll ask Deanna. <laughs> well, well, actually. <laughs> It, it would be interesting, interesting to start a continued study to endangered species, or now I would say three endangered species of pipes, conida, spectacolida, and salazida on the both We have sides. audio problems, same as we had in Russian. Yes, we still have your, yeah. You were fine in English before, but now we're getting your echo again, Deanna. I don't know what mm. you did when you gave your talk. Mm. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, Oh, oh, but my piece didn't, didn't pick up, up the <laughs> just <laughs> handphone. Okay, okay, just, just a, a moment. moment. <laughs> oh, are you in the English room or in the Russian room? You should be in the English room if you're speaking English. Yes, yes I, I am, am in, in the English, English room. room. Oh, okay. Well, that wasn't it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I think your comment was it would be interesting to see um, some studies about the three eider species and some comparisons between across the border between those. Oh, oh yes, yeah. yeah. Lauren, did you want to comment on that? Yes, I think any surveys that we could implement in more communities in both Alaska and the Russian side of um, for for year round surveys, um, not just seasonal surveys would be really valuable and just being able to have access to those data widely um, for a broader perspective would be really interesting. I think we do have another question for Deanna, but I, I don't know about the audio, but um, about the whether you think the decline in nesting eiders at Sean 
is, I'm not sure how that you pronounce it, Sean, is a local phenomenon um, at just that study site or could it be occurring at other breeding areas in Arctic Russia? That's a very good question. question. <laughs> Brilliant question. <laughs> but as, as I said, said Chang Camp is the only camp in Russia which is monitoring, monitoring this species. So we have no idea what happened in the core breeding area in Nidirka Delta, in uh, Yana Nidirka Lowland, no area. So it would be nice to have a project running there and recording the nesting density there, because there are historical records by fish and wildlife service. So I would be happy to have it, but... I think, Lauren, you were the only one that I heard bring up the issue of plastics, and is um, uh, any of the counterparts on the Russian side, are you seeing an issue with uh, marine debris, plastics in nests, in bird tissue and eggs. And I guess Dimitri or Maria. Maria, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, I, I, I didn't say because of the short time, but uh, Severna Zemlya is the most remote archipelago, but it is impacted by the plastic already. Once ice disappeared, the currents brought plastic to the coast and uh, we observe uh, approximately like in a one third sites we visited were heavily impacted by the marine debris, plastic debris. We collected some samples for the microplastic but we didn't get analysis yet. And uh, uh, we observed plastic in the seabed nests in the uh, Glaucus gall nests and uh, common iodine nests, uh, they, they use plastic fishing gear is uh, present in the area. It's, uh, it's of great concern, actually. Mm -hmm. And Dimitri, have you seen any issue of plastics in your monitoring? Well, yes. We have seen uh, plastic uh, thrown up on the coasts in certain areas. Mostly we see bottles. Um, if we're talking about uh, die-offs of birds or any other uh, animals, we haven't really seen that significantly. We have seen some of our n northern seals who have been uh, tangled in plastic. Uh, of different kinds, but we haven't seen anything significant, but we are taking it into account in our research. But, but we observed, observed uh, drowned uh, little ox in the fishing gear in the most remote island in the Kara Sea, far away from the commercial fishery. I think, yeah. Okay, we have questions from Alexander first and then Kathy. Alexander? Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Um, I have a question for Lauren. Could you provide some updates on um, marine sanctuary on St. George Island? There has been initiative a few years back and we participated in supporting that initiative. Any development on that? That's a great question. So I work for the LA Community of St. Paul. However, I do work with St. George on marine conservation. The St. George community nominated um, a national marine sanctuary for the 30 miles around St. George Island, 20 miles between St. Paul and St. George. Uh, it was accepted into an inventory in the federal government's um, National Marine Sanctuary inventory. It's still in that inventory. Um, it has not been moved uh, out of inventory into scoping, uh, which is the next process to establish a sanctuary in the area. Um, it, it's not entirely clear when or if that will happen, but it is still in the inventory. And in the meantime, we are looking to um, bring both St. Paul and St. George together around a uh, Purple Up Islands wide marine conservation strategy, which would um, go out to 100 nautical miles and kind of look at the science and 
um, community knowledge around um, potential conservation or particularly since we're talking marine debris and fishing gear, um, fishing uh, management actions that may be uh, possible for future protections of our marine waters. So there, there unfortunately has been no forward movement in the St. George uh, Onanga Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, but we are looking at um, broader efforts together uh, currently. Thanks, Lauren. Kathy? Yeah, not a question so much, but going back to, to your question about what we would like to see in terms of what could we do to look across the pond, so to speak, bring our data together. And I think that's a really exciting prospect, uh, particularly for seabirds, both at colonies, but also at sea. If you notice, most of our surveys ended at the dateline. We have very little coverage on the Western side, but there's, there's so much indication that as birds decline in one area, it doesn't necessarily mean that their populations have disappeared, but perhaps they're shifting distribution and, and indications we have is that they're shifting perhaps westward and northward. And I've seen some preliminary uh, satellite tags, for instance, for shoe waters indicating that they use Russian waters more than our Chukchi waters. So um, I think it would just be great. I see, I see all these little pieces like Dimitri talking about. I think he said the common myrrh was increasing in some of his, the islands he was monitoring. And while they're decreasing in some of our areas, so it'd be very nice to have the bigger picture with the two sides working together to look at that so we don't keep talking about our own little corners so much and you know that's just the point I wanted to make I, I hope we can continue the dialogue and exchange data. Does anyone want to comment on that? I think um I think often the scientists want to, it's often kind of the higher politics that sometimes get in the way of that data sharing. So hopefully we can, um, and especially maybe with the Arctic Council chairmanship going to the um, to Russia for the next two years, maybe this is something that can be highlighted as well. Margaret. Well, if I can just add real quickly, it's something we've been working towards within the Circumpolar Seabird Group as Maria knows. and and um, maybe we can continue to use that as a nexus to work out from there. Margaret, did you want to comment on that or? No, that's a great, that's a great venue, Kathy. And I was just, it's a pity we didn't, um, that Heather wasn't able to join us because the, in, in terms of sharing data and collaboration across the Southern part of the Bering Sea, we have the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge and the Commander Islands Nature Reserve and they're kind of sister refuges, sister reserves. And I know it's been a dream <laughs> to bring the Tekla, the research vessel over to the commanders. It's been very difficult, but um, we've had, um, I know there have been a variety of exchanges back and forth and there's a, there's a definitely a foundation there. So that's, that's another venue for sharing information, but Kathy and Lauren and Dimitri and Maria and Diana, you all are uh, the people to, to best figure out how to do that. So I'm really glad we're having this conversation. Yes, and tell us how we can support you in those efforts. <laughs> because that is that is something, certainly um, the Alaska Ocean Observing System and our data portal that is um, you know, with a big focus right now on the Bering Sea and the Bering Strait region. We are looking at how can we get uh, Russian and US data integrated. And so you see a, a, a clean picture across the entire Bering Strait, Bering Sea region. So you get a better vision of that. So I think we just have a few minutes left, but, um, and um, maybe I'll just, just throw it out to politics. It, it seems like all of the work that you're doing and all of the changes that you're seeing just raise lots of really important questions in terms of, of um, addressing things like shipping, things like marine pollution and plastics. And certainly the work you're doing is, is having, um, is uh, has a relationship with commercial fishing and subsistence use and whether seabirds are indicators or whether they're um, how their relationship to um, to various changes in fisheries. Um, and I guess I would just throw just out a general question to uh, to all of you, how what 
ways you think seabird research could be improved or increased to help policymakers answer some of those questions? What, what needs to be done there? Any suggestions? Maria, do you have a suggestion there? Uh -huh. I, I would love to have a suggestion working for the politicians and administrators. Well, di difficult to say because uh, it's a little bit a distance or oh, huge distance between science and uh, politicians. But what I could say positive, uh, for example, on my, on my side that I, I, uh, I, was, I was able to to get some support for the seabird study from the uh, from the industry, and this is a good sign. And but uh, I am as optimistic. I I looking forward for the Arctic Council chairmanship, uh, Russia, and uh, probably uh, we will have some advance into the uh, biodiversity and conservation problems. And as far as I know, the issue of the specially protected areas and marine specially protected areas will be put on agenda. And I hope that will happen. Thank you for that. And I also want to note that Maria, it's about um, three in the morning, your time. Um, so we really appreciate your, your staying up and looking so wide awake for us. So um, Kathy, did you have a comment? Wanted to comment on that? Uh, yeah, just in terms of support, I think what I would like to see is uh, what I think would benefit seabird work, particularly in these remote areas, is to involve the local communities uh, more, for instance, in actual in monitoring, like the refuge, for instance, the maritime refuge in Alaska does not cover St. Lawrence Island or the Diomedes and their, you know, the university, Sasha Stutyski. And Alexis Will are working somewhat on St. Lawrence Island, but um, some of the major colonies don't have uh, refuge status or they do not have regular monitoring efforts, but I think the local community members would very much like to be involved in that. And it would be great to get some information on some of these colonies that number in the millions of birds and we have almost no information on them. So um, that would be my bit is to involve the communities in the monitoring efforts. Good suggestion there. Any other comments? Well, I'm gonna turn it back over, I guess, to you, Margaret, for kind of bringing it all, wrapping it all up together. Well, this has been great and interesting. And again, we will post the recording on uh, WWF's Facebook page and also the AOS, AOS home, homepage. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for participating. A couple of themes that I think are worth highlighting, one just Kathy raised again and Lauren brought up, and I think that's the, the value of collaboration between uh, communities and the science community. And um, I'm just uh, thinking about, we, we were supporting a, a project on Little Diomede Island, and I know we had, we had hoped to have participants from Diomede because they're right there in the center, seeing those big vessels cruise through and they're gonna be uh, bearing the brunt if something happens. So I would love to um, support further you know, research, local research initiatives there. And um, there is also Donna Hauser and Hayo Eichen at, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks have been supporting the Alaska, let's see, a, it's the AOK Network, Alaska Arctic, Oceans Knowledge Hub. I may be getting some of the acronyms wrong, but I think that's an, another exciting um, community collaboration where communities are working with scientists. And I think the next, next stage is to um, basically have the, the community collaborators define and, and lead the science agenda. But um, we could perhaps through you and collaboration with that group, help you know, spur the interest in birds. That's just an idea. Um, so community collaboration, and then I think um, the value of marine protected areas uh, was very much um, on my mind as I heard again about um, the Commander Islands and the fact that they have, um, you know, I've known this, but I think it's worth pointing out that there is this 30 mile um, 
buffer zone around these islands, which means uh, no commercial fishing within 30 miles of the islands, uh, no shipping, although you know there are occasional violations. And it's quite an extraordinary thing to have this in the Bering Sea. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from it and anything um, you in Alaska can do to support collaboration with the commanders, I think would be very exciting. And I know um, there's a strong interest in international collaboration there. And um, let's see, what else did I wanna say? Um, I think that's it. Just um, really glad to have these opportunities to bring people together. And we, we touched on some ecosystem issues and fish in our last seminar. I think um, Molly, we may do fish as a focus next time. And we'll keep doing this throughout the year and hope that you will come back and join us. I just wanna echo Margaret's um, thanks to all of you as well for your participation today. I know the time zone challenge is, um, thank you, Maria, and thank you, um, Dimitri and um, Deanna, because I think you were actually speaking to us from tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so thank you for doing that. And uh, thank you to all of, to, um, all of the, um, the participants too, um, who were able to um, listen in and just remember we will have recordings of this available. So, uh, and if you have suggestions for how we can um, improve this or make it more accessible for you, or if you have ideas of speakers for future sessions, you can always email myself or Margaret um, Williams at WWF or Jill Pruitt at AUS either of us, and um, we'd be happy to, to work with all of you on this. So again, um, just, and it's Pruitt at AUS.org. Jill Jill's right on top. She put her email address in the chat. So um, just get that to her. But again, I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank our interpreters, um, the uh, Russian to English and English to Russian. And we'll try to figure out what the echo chamber was, what that issue was and get that resolved by the next one. But wanna thank all of you and to thank um, Stephanie Lee as well at WWF for helping organize it and, um, and Jill Pruitt um, on the AU side for helping organize it. So again, I think that's it. Thank you very much for being here today and um, we will talk to you at our next session. So have a good weekend. Thanks, Molly. Good to see you everyone. Maria, спасибо.